Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome. We are presenting tonight Jews in Colonial New York with Francis Tavern Museum and the American Jewish Historical Society. Francis Tavern Museum preserves and interprets the history of the American Revolutionary Era through public education. This mission is fulfilled through the interpretation and preservation of the museum's collections, landmark buildings, and public programs that serve the community. The American Jewish Historical Society is the oldest cultural archive in the United States with over 30 million documents, books, photographs, art, and artifacts that reflect the history of the Jewish presence in the United States from 1654 to the present. Both institutions are located in New York City, and we encourage you to visit them both in person and online. My name is Rebecca Miller, and I handle programming here at the AJHS, and I'm very pleased to welcome Francis Tavern Museum, who's with us this evening. I'd like to welcome and introduce you to Mary Chaltis Adamanelli from Francis Tavern. Mary develops public programming and content that focuses on the colonial revolutionary era. Her research focuses on interpreting the lives of historically excluded people of the 18th century. Mary was recently awarded the Museum Association of New York's Rising Star Award. And from AJHS, I'm pleased to welcome and introduce Melanie Myers, our Chair of Collections and Engagement at the AJHS. Prior to joining AJHS in 2018, she was the Senior Manager for Reference and Outreach at the Center for Jewish History. And she served as an instructor at the Palmer School of Library and Information Science at Long Island University and has worked with special collections in a variety of settings, including private, nonprofit, and academic institutions. Welcome, both of you. Hello and good evening, everybody. It's an honor to be with you guys tonight. I'm so yes, excited. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's an honor to. Uh, to get to do this program with our learned colleagues uh, from Francis Tavern. So yes, wonderful. We have a lot to dive in today. Um, me and Melanie were both talking about the amount of research that we had and the amount of research that we had to cut because we were so overwhelmed with a 45 minute spot. <laughs> so today we're gonna look at uh, colonial New York, the origins of the first Jewish community in New York City, um, prominent families, there is some finding aids that we're going to show you. So I guess we should get started with where everything began. So let's start at the very beginning at New York. Oh, I was going to say New York City, but it should be New Amsterdam. OK. Um, so in September of 1654, a group of 23 Jews, including women and children, uh, arrived in New Amsterdam. The group was made up of Spanish and Portuguese origin who had been living in Recife, Brazil. And then when the Brit uh, Portuguese defeated the Dutch for the control of Recife, uh, it brought with them the Inquisition and they left that area. Yes. Yes, that is correct. Um, and also, so the Spanish and Portuguese uh, Jews that had been in Brazil um, had gone to Brazil uh, because basically, well, in uh, 1492, the Jews were expelled from Spain and then they were expelled from Portugal about four years later. So they're all departing for a variety um, of different locales in search of tolerance, uh, you know, in search or, or at least of um, a modicum of freedom of religious observance, and they go to Brazil. And as Mary said, but then the Portuguese take control of Brazil, and they realize that the Inquisition and the restrictions on Jews are coming there as well. So they decide to go to uh, what was then New Amsterdam, um, you know, hoping that this would be um, a welcoming place for them. And uh, I was reading up on this, and it becomes because of the um, almost a diaspora at this point, even by the 1650s, it becomes New, uh, New Amsterdam becomes this first Jewish communal settlement, right? It's the first time that the community is able to settle, have roots, stay here for a while because they're looking for that tolerance. Um, almost though, because it's not really a conversation without talking about Stuyvesant. Uh, Peter um, Stuyvesant, yes. yes who Dutch was... governor Peter Stuyvesant who was not happy um, about the Jews coming was, um, and, and I think also wanted to expel them as well, was not tolerant, was not interested in having them here, um, but ended up being overruled by, uh, you know, by his superiors who said, no, you know, we need people to be here. Um, we need yeah. people that are going to stay here. They're gonna establish businesses that are going to, 
you know, promote trade and all of these other economic and, you know, just sort of colonizing goals within that area. So he was ultimately unsuccessful in expelling them. And that is when um, the first uh, Jewish congregation in North America is established um, in Lower Manhattan, which is uh, uh, Sharif Israel, um, which yeah. is still in existence now, although all the way uptown, um, no longer in its original location. Um, and those and those original congregants were those first uh, 23 people that came. So um, the original congregants were largely of Sephardic origin, which are uh, Jewish people from Iberia, Spain, and Portugal. Although Sharif Israel has always had a congregation that was welcoming to both Sephardic and um, Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi Jews as well. Yeah. So. Um, it took a while even to get Mill Street established and, and, and open to the public. I was reading um, about how religious tolerance was very slow coming, even in Dutch New Amsterdam. Um, and it always amazes me because you think of New York City as millions of people. Uh, 1700, the Jewish population of America in that entire continent area was only about two to 300 people. So we're talking about making a congregation. Oh, you were on All right, I mean, Yes, very, very small um, population. Very, very small. Yes. Yeah. Um, and then in 1740, Parliament passes a few acts um, by the time the British take over. So we've become yes. New York at the time. British uh, yes. Parliament passes a few laws that make it easier to become freemans of the city, to own property, and then essentially to worship in public because previously they had only been allowed to worship in private, which is a, why... Yes. Sharif Israel was able to form the Mill Street Synagogue. That's true. It's also worth mentioning that when um, governance of the colony switched from Dutch to English rule, um, a lot of the, um, some of the Jewish families left as well. Mm -hmm. They chose to either go to the Netherlands or um, go to, to other places. They did not necessarily stay. But you still see this core group of individuals who stay who form, um, you know, Sharif Israel and really make it into this thriving seat of the Jewish community in New York, which, um, you know, and again, they have a very long and storied history, but it wasn't just a synagogue. It was also really, they served an enormous amount of needs for the Jewish community, basically from, you know, from birth until death, um, which they still do, uh, you know, very well. So, And it was the only synagogue, which uh, while mm -hmm. I was doing this research really was the only synagogue for such a long time. And I think, I That's mean, I'm right, born and yeah. raised in Brooklyn. I, the Jewish community has always been around me. So the fact that they're knowing that in the entire British colonies, there was just the one synagogue is, yeah. I always have to remember, we're going back in time. We're going back in time. No, it's true. And I mean, for the first 175 years from Sharif Israel's founding for you know close to, I'm, I'm approximating 175 years, if you were Jewish in New York City, that was your congregation. I mean, that yeah. was it. Yeah. Um, so when you read who are members of Sharif Israel, it's a who's who of all of these important people in terms of colonial uh, New York and New Amsterdam. So, yeah. Uh, Mary and Melanie, I have a question for you. I'm seeing in the chat. Yeah. You mentioned that Sharif Israel today is uptown. Do we know where it was originally when uh, it was first um, brought together? Sort of, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> Mary has a great map, actually. Yes, that we I can, do. We can put up on the screen um, to show. I mean, it was it was then called the Mill Street Synagogue, and um, it is. If you look at Sharif Israel's website, which I also encourage people to do, they have an enormous amount about their own history, illustrious members, the history of the congregation, and basically, it's estimated. Well, you can see from the helpful arrow. You can't see me pointing at my screen. Yeah, this it's map, to be clear, is from 1695. So it, this is, I think, the synagogue that predates almost like that meeting, not necessarily a synagogue, but the meeting place that they were in in 1695, which was around Beaver Street. So you around can see Beaver Street. around yeah. Beaver Street. And then when they were allowed to worship in public and they consecrated uh, Sharif yeah. Israel, they were able to go to this beautiful map where yes. I've color coordinated everything because I wanted to show oh, everybody right. just how close everybody was. Yes. Um, All these things are very close together. Yeah. As far as anyone can tell where um, the Mill Street Synagogue was, which is the little orange uh, thing, it's basically where William Street is now. So it's clearly the financial district. And again, very, very close to, uh, to Francis Tavern. 
So um, you have an enormous amount of activity, of economic activity. Um, you have this Jewish synagogue as well as community hub all happening in a really small uh, geographic area. That's really the locus of an enormous amount of activity. Um, yeah, and it was consecrated in um, 1730. Yeah. But yeah. But always and remember. It was Beaver Street. But they on rented top- on Beaver Street. So. Yeah. So on top of everybody being below City Hall, which is kind of around here in the city commons yeah. that we know today, everybody was packed down in New York City. So they're all very condensed to begin with. But remember that they wanted to be close to the congregation. So when I was trying to figure out where all of these prominent families were and where their shops were, they mm-hmm. were all within like a very small walking distance today. So you can literally yeah. go to Francis Tavern, you can walk down Broad Street and retrace all of these steps. I mean, yeah. New York City is New York City, so you'll probably find a plaque. Uh, yeah, something. Like but, <laughs> but you will be able to find all of these places. Yeah, when I'm, I, I'm actually recently, I live in Brooklyn, so I don't spend a huge amount of time in lower Manhattan, but we were down there recently and I was amazed by the amount of plaques and monuments for people and yeah. things that I wasn't even aware of um, are there. It's, yeah. uh, they commemorated a lot of things. The 19th century was a big heyday for plaques and uh, public memory and commemoration. It was a big time. 19th and early 20th century, as we well know, um, was a big time for those types of monuments and commemorations. Yeah. It's always very funny to see a plaque next to like a Dwayne Reed. I know. Right. Yeah. And (laughs) and honestly, where where AJHS is, we're near Union Square and there's a lot of them even there. Like, and and where like anthropology was, there's a plaque (laughs) that says what what was originally originally there. And it's, um, you know, there's just so much history here, even, even in ways we don't even, you know, we, we sort of, I think, gloss over with our gaze all the time, but it's living, you know, we're, it's around us all the time. So, yeah. Should we move on to the rabbi of Sharith Israel? Sure. Uh, he was, I should probably introduce him properly. Rabbi Gersha Mendez Seisha. Yes. yes. Uh, Seisha. Was Notably, as I saw through all of my research, very proud of this, uh, the first American born spiritual leader, um, which goes into making the roots of the Jewish community in New York City. um, And the fact that now we have generations who are in the synagogue who are part of the community and who are are Mm -hmm. staying and instead of leaving and relocating and relocating because you see that during the Revolutionary War. um, He was a prominent, prominent patriot. He. Yes, very much so preached a lot about independence. He wanted to be free. And it was interesting to me when I was learning about why, and this is always interesting when you learn about the Revolutionary War, of why somebody stays loyal to the crown or why they want to be independent. And Mm -hmm. again, even with these very prominent families, you see a lot of disconnect. Um, But he really spoke to the congregation about wanting to be independent and how this would help tolerance within the Jewish community and I saw a lot of citations going back to our founding fathers promoting things like religious tolerance and freedom Mm -hmm. for all and understanding that, you know, group who've been prosecuted were like, wait, this is what we want too. Is this what we need? Let's follow that. Um, Yeah. And and he did, I mean, he was the first um, American, uh, you know, uh, he was the, he delivered a sermon in English. He was at uh, George Washington's inauguration. He helped found Columbia University. I miss this was yeah. someone who was just, and, and I think you see this a lot when you look at the various people who are congregants of, of, this, of this synagogue. These are people who are deeply involved in the religious lives of their community, but are also deeply involved with New York City and its institutions. Yeah. And later on in the history of Sharif Israel, when you look into the 19th and, and early 20th century, these are people that are deeply involved with all the communal organizations that spring up that, um, you know, that also really serve to just provide an enormous amount of sort of communal infrastructure for the Jewish community. And, um, and the Seishas family was very prominent. And yes. um, later generations of the Seishas family were members of the DAR. And, um, you know, and because they could trace that lineage all the way back. And that was something that was really, really important for late 19th and early 20th century um, Jewish families. Because, um, you know, as Rebecca said, the AJHS was founded in 1892. 
And it was founded, I'm just very briefly, I'm not going to give people the big lecture, you know, on the AJHS, <laughs> but it was basically founded to document the, um, the contributions of Jewish Americans because there was an enormous amount of anti-Semitism. And so one of the things they're really aggressively trying to document early on is participation and patriotism and being able to trace those lineages back, you know, to the Revolutionary War, because you're also now 100 years past the war, right, you're seeing a lot of, again, these monuments and these uh, commemorations happening. And so what they're trying to really assert here is like, we were there too. You know, even though there's a lot of Jewish immigration happening now and a lot that happened later, but no, we were here and we, um, you know, did an enormous amount of work and, you know, put a lot of ourselves, money, bodies, on the line to help create, you know, this infant, you know, this country in its infancy. And this was um, really a point of pride for not just the early AJHS, but for a lot of, you know, these families that stayed and, you know, again, could trace that lineage back. We have um, actually papers of a woman named Alice Davis Menken, who was a, who's an amazing, really interesting woman who actually I forget if she founded it or was just one of the first members um, of her family was in Sharif, Israel from way back because she was she was a satious and uh, going all the way back. And um, she uh, she founded the first um, Sharif Isra uh, sisterhood, like so to help, you know, raise money and do all these other things for the congregation. And um, she was in the D.A.R. and all of these other institutions. And we actually have her handwritten genealogy where she's tracing her whole family. Um, all the way back. And you can tell this was something that she was very proud of. And I think a lot of other people were as well to be able to say, you know, we've been here too. <laughs> and oh, I we, think that's always we, amazing. You know, and, um, and, and I think about it now and I feel, you know, we've all gotten kind of spoiled by things like ancestry oh, and yeah. <laughs> old free, where you can sit there like they do on the commercials and type it in and every life has a story and it shows you the whole tree it was much, much harder to do in that time. You needed to have an enormous amount more documentation that was very, it was much more difficult to get. And so yeah. for people to put in that kind of work, um, you know, to, to be able to document it to that level to get into the DAR was really, you know, quite an accomplishment. And it showed um, how important this was to a lot of these people. So Yeah, because I was curious to see if they, if they as like a general sense, how many men were Jewish served in the Continental Army or even in the British Army? Because I was looking mm -hmm. at the families that were divided and where they went and what they're doing. And the best estimate that I was able to find was maybe around 100 to 200, which sounds so little. But when you think about the by 1776, the estimates are that the Jewish population was around 2000 people. So that's still okay. a significant like percentage yes. that you know, signed up to fight for this, which I think is incredible. I mean, I say this Absolutely. is a first generation Greek American. Anytime anybody can trace their lineage, I'm like, what is that like? That's amazing. I mean, yeah, it's, it, it really is. And, um, and as I said, it was really um, very much a point of pride. And I went to the DAR website because they have actually a freely available genealogical database. And I looked it up to see, and I typed in her name and sure enough, Alice Davis Menken, and it shows like the verified yeah. Um, you know, genealogy. And she actually, I believe, was able to get uh, membership on both sides because that's how, because both her mother and her father's family went back far enough that she could establish that lineage for, um, at that point when she was applying, you know, it was 140 years later. So, yeah, was, which is incredible. Right. I mean, I'm too lazy to look stuff up on Ancestry. I can't even imagine, <laughs> you know, actually, you know, it was an enormous amount of work. But again, I think it shows how important that was for people yeah. and um, prestige. So I think it would be a good time to shift to the AJS and Francis Tavern connection, because this was one okay. of my favorite things to look into. Um, and I want to give uh, Abigail Franks her due. Oh, uh, she Quite a woman. Yeah. She was one of my favorite women. I think she's now one of my top favorite 18th century women, uh, hands down across the board. Uh, so. Should we show an image of Abigail? Because I was going to yeah. say, I have the portrait database okay. up here. So let me, hold on. Uh, here we go. Low portrait databases. So just very quickly for um, for those of you who are watching at home, 
Um, one of the things that AJHS has, because we are primarily a library and archive, unlike um, the tavern, which is really more of a, a museum, um, we have an enormous amount of books and documents, which we make available online um, and are available digitally. And I'll show some of them today, so then you can look at them at home you, um, from anywhere. But one of them is this database of early American um, portraits that was funded by the Loeb family, whose family also goes all the way back. And so let's let's find Abigail Franks here. And She's there's, in a beautiful a blue dress. Do so you see the family? Yes. Yeah. So yeah, the, the Franks younger. children, which... <laughs> Here, we'll so we'll the go. Frank family were a very prominent family. So we're talking founding families uh, in New York City at the time. Mm -hmm. And the Franks have a very interesting connection to the original owners of 54 Pearl Street, which is now Francis Tavern Museum with the Delancey mm -hmm. family. So mm -hmm. Byla Abigail Levy Franks, you see there on your screen, that's beautiful, beautiful, uh, beautiful portrait of her, um, had several children and she was very... Um, she reminds me a lot, very, hear me out on this reference, very Emily Gilmore from Gilmore Girls, right? A very <laughs> staunch, like matriarch of the family who always had something to say and was very stern and strong in her beliefs. Yes. And all of those are documented in your, in your collection because she wrote so heavily to her son, Neftali, in London about the things that were going on in New York City at the time. So she left one of the best primary resources of the Jewish experience during 1740s, 1750s that, I mean, you dream of references like this. Um, so one of her daughters, Fila, poor Fila, fell in love with Oliver Delancey, the son of Etienne Delancey who built 54 Pearl Street. Uh, Oliver Delancey was not a Jewish young man. Uh, and that causes a lot of problems when the two secretly elope and don't tell anybody for six months. And the more that I found out about this, the more I just went, oh no. I know. Uh, the more I just, so the Franks had several children and I will briefly go over all of Abigail's thoughts on all of her choices in uh, children's spouses. So Fila, when the family finds out, she wakes up one day and she announces to the family that she's married Oliver six months ago and she's going off to live with him. Uh, Abigail cuts off her daughter completely, writes to her son in London that the sun doesn't shine anymore and I've retreated to my home. I can no longer see the sun. My life is over. What are people going to do? What are people going to think, essentially? Um, she never speaks to her daughter again. Fila marries Oliver. They go on to live a, I think, seemingly beautiful life. I wasn't able to find much about them. They seem to kind of just drift off. Um, I was able to find out that um, Abigail's husband, Jacob, doesn't completely exile his daughter. I was very happy to hear something about that. He understands that she chose for love. It may not have been the right decision for their family, but he doesn't cut her off financially and he's able to give her um, her trust fund essentially and like stays in sort of contact, but doesn't totally tell his wife about it. Um, so Abigail writes about all of these things and she is very much a very religious woman. She keeps kosher. She keeps Sabbath. She wants her children to marry other Jewish children. She doesn't want to marry outside of the faith. She wants to keep the community. She wants to keep her culture. This is while, as you're looking at this portrait, it's done in a very English manner. So you're talking about one of the wealthiest families, not necessarily even in the Jewish community, but in the colonies at the time. Um, she hires um, one of the most notable portrait artists. I have a photo, I have a portrait of Naftali as well. And I think it's on the John, I got it from the John Loeb collection. She is, she does these in an English style, right? This is to show how much money that she has, the power that she has and the influence of it. So you see this merger of making these portraits and you know, you're putting yourself back into the historical narrative by making these portraits. And she doesn't just do it for herself. She does it for all of her children. These are the oldest set of portraits um, in, I think, colonial American history, if I'm not mistaken, of a full family. And they're so, they're so beautiful. You can see Frank's uh, children with bird and then Frank's children with lamb and rose. Uh, those children are unidentifiable, um, but I will go into the other children and their marriages. And just when I say how much I love Abigail is her reaction to all of these 
uh, marriage proposals. So she encourages her son, Eftali, to marry a nice Jewish woman uh, in London. And she's like, there's not enough of them. So you have to marry your cousin. And I guess she was so relentless about it that he just gives, he gives in and marries his cousin who is also named Fila. So when I was doing this research, it got very confusing. Um, yes. And also, so as a, just to butt in for one second, because, yeah. um, because you're totally right. She was a woman of many opinions, mm -hmm. lots of them. I'm sure many of us can sympathize with that. Um, and, but she was extremely devout, but she was also very involved with the secular New York culture as well. She was deeply involved with the community. Um, her son, Naftali, who is where the core of the collection that AJHS has is all of these letters that she wrote to Naftali in England. They sent him to England basically to mind the family business there and to be educated there. And that's where um, you find out about a lot of this, like her feelings about what's happening. Um, so there's two very interesting side notes to that. So she refers to him in these letters, which um, by the way, are all fully digitized. I'll show you, and this is the Frank's family papers. Um, and you can see um, all the letters are here. They're fully digitized. Um, so if you're looking here and you click view that folder, up will come eventually when my slow internet catches up, um, all of these um, beautiful letters. But so she refers to him, as you can see here, dear heartsy which is Yiddish for dear heart. It's her pet name for, um, for her son, who she obviously just loved dearly. But she also was um, so devout and so kosher that even when her son was living with family, she was arranging for kosher food to be sent to him because she felt that her own family members were too sloppy in their observance of, uh, of cash root and having a proper Jewish home. So yeah, she was um, she she was really quite a formidable woman, I would say. So. Yeah, she had a lot to say about um, everything. <laughs> um, there was when she was talking about Fila's marriage to her son. Um, she criticized that choice. And she said, do you expect your sisters to be nuns unless they can meet with the person that can keep them a coach? And I, and I suppose they must not think of challenging and changing their condition. Uh, would they present a worthy person? So then looking at her next uh, proposals to come into her children, um, there was one, the uh, allegedly I read, keep in mind, these are maybe possibly. Uh, the courtship of her daughter Rika to a member of the New York Sephardic Gomez family, which we'll talk about in a little bit. She regarded the, regarded the prospective bridegroom to be a stupid wretch. So she, even within the community, had a lot of things to say. Um, it's been interesting. But what's fascinating to me is that as you get to the younger children, her son David moves to Philadelphia and marries a Christian. And their children are baptized as Christians. And he he maintains himself as a Jewish man in Philadelphia, but not as strictly practicing as he was in New York City. And she still writes to him. She says nothing. There's no criticism. And I'm just, I feel so, I feel for Fila when I mm -hmm. read that. And it was like looking at her relationship with all of her children, all six of them, and how she handles their marriages and how she treats them. And I was in that moment very thankful for my mother. <laughs> uh, but it seems that she held her daughters to a, a slightly higher standard or had, I guess, just very different wishes yeah. and aspirations. But I also feel like this is, you know, a tale you see over and over again in families where the older generation is just not happy that the younger generation of children and grandchildren do not feel the same way about yeah. religious observance, about, um, you know, just culture and lives and, and how they want to live and how um, for someone like her, I think that was a really bitter pill to swallow. And, and I agree. I felt so bad for, you know, poor Fila reading this, like her mother basically just, just cuts her off cuts and they eventually off. moved to England because um, as you intimated before, when you're talking about these families, they were a divided family. Like some people were, and a lot of them actually were loyalists. And a lot of the family ended up moving back to England. Yeah. Um, you know, some stayed. And I think that's very typical well, the families, not just Jewish families, but, you know, some families were, they had deep ties to England, um, especially, you know, commercial ties. And, you know, some of them were, you know, I think there's a, a lot of a, a spectrum there of people, you know, some who were staunch loyalists, some who were in favor of the revolution and, you know, some who, 
you know, we're sort of somewhere in between waiting yeah. to see what happened. But. I did see a question come in about where Jacob made his money. Um, it was a variety of trades, including the slave trade, privateering, yeah. general commerce and shipping. Uh, so true. very mercantile. Yes, he was also um, a linguist and um, did some uh, Judaic scholarship, but yeah, mostly a merchant. Um, and yes, he certainly um, yeah he engaged in the slave trade. That is absolutely that is absolutely true. And that is uh, yeah, privateering, commerce, shipping, all of these things. So let's move on to another family. How about the Gomezes? We can go with the Gomez's. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Uh, oh, and here's the Gomez family papers too. Yeah, the Gomez, they are the AJHS uh, Gomez family papers are really interesting. Um, I was able to pull a couple of things off of their finding aids. So I definitely recommend you guys poke through and read all of those letters. Um, also, I'm just a stickler for. I love a good digitized collection. They're just really fun to go through as a historian. Um, so the Gomez family, a lot like the Franks, were very, uh, they were big pillars of the community as well. They were some of the richest families in New York City at the time. They, again, had their trade through mercantile purposes. So they had shops, they did trading. Um, and they did one of my favorite things. They were chocolatiers. Oh yeah, let me stop my screen share so you can, can show that. They were chocolatiers. I'm gonna pull up, let's see where are my advertisements for this. They were chocolatiers. So, whoops, here's that map again. We have our Mill Street Synagogue. Let me go through this as we go that way. Um, we have a picture of Sasha. There we go. Isaac Moses, who we'll talk about in a little bit, and then the Gomez family. So this is their coat of arms, and they actually have a family motto, which I thought was really interesting because I hadn't seen that before, or I just kind of gloss over when I see them in general. Um, Boundless as the fishes of the sea was honor and integrity of the Gomez family, supported by lion's strength, did their faith uphold, nor would they change it for a crown of gold. Uh, very cool. I loved it. It is, it is very cool. Um, and there's a historic site um, yes. about the Gomez family, which is in upstate New York. Um, just like the Sharif Israel website, I would recommend looking at the website for the Gomez Mill House, which has a lot of really, really wonderful information about the family um, and about their role in commerce and also, um, you know, their role in the revolution as well, um, because they, um, yeah, it, it's really... Um, it's a nice site. They, have, they also have a very nice website that gives a lot of information and also has some nice digital articles and whatnot um, yeah. about the history of the family. So the Gomez family, like the early Jewish settlers, came here because of persecution from Spain. Uh, the patriarch was Isaac Gomez, who was an influential Spaniard um, who had closely advised the king of Spain at the time. And then I don't know if this is legend or not, but I kept seeing it come up. Um, he was so close to the king that as the Inquisition was coming in and they were torturing and killing Jewish people in Spain, the king had a very cryptic message to give him to let him know that they were coming for him. And I kept seeing that it was the onions are beginning to smell. So when the king of Spain told Luke Isaac that he took his family and they came to the, they went to Bayonne, France for a little bit. They went over to England and then the whole family came over quite a little bit after that. Um, so they come here somewhere in the 17, if I'm not mistaken, seven, uh, 1690s, if not a little bit later, 17, oh, 1700, pardon me. The Gomez family moved to the new financial center of the new world. Um, they come here, they are very big in mercantile. They hit the ground running. They have, like Melanie said, the Gomez Mill House, which is in Marble, New York. And is that is the oldest standing Jewish dwelling in North America and the oldest historic house in Orange County. It is always incredible when something like that is still standing. That as kind of an outpost. Uh, it was a place for Louis, Isaac's son, to stay with his children um, as they oversaw things in trading that they were doing. So you're thinking kind of upstate New York, it's like timber, limestone, commodities, like beaver pelts, animal pelts, things like that. Um, and they stayed there for a while because it was just easier to stay there instead of traveling with all of your stuff. And it was, 
I'm not a trader in the 18th century, but I'm imagining traveling back then was not as easy as it was today to get on. No, not as quick, not as easy, especially hauling around all of this, all of this stuff. I mean, yeah, yeah, it was uh, an undertaking. So the advertisements that I have pulled up here, Rebecca Gomez was the widow of Mordecai, who was one of Lewis's sons. Um, So after he passes away, she takes on one of their stores and she becomes one of the main chocolatiers in New York City at the time. Uh, So anytime I see an advertisement that has a woman in in the front of it, I get very excited and I want to know her role and I want to know a little bit more. Um, But you can see and I'll show you on my map as well where they were located. Go back to that big first one. So you can see I have Rebecca Gomez's chocolate shop is in purple. So it's right here. So it's, I mean, a good situation right next to Fort George at the time. Um, so this would have been in the 1770s, 1780s, a little bit after that. So, I mean, it's still pretty good location today. I mean, it's right next to the water. <laughs> Yeah, I just walked around there recently. I'm like, right next to Fort George. I know where that is. It's pretty it's amazing. Yeah. I love this map, I have to say. And I love the, the colors you put on it because it really, I think, shows, again, how close all of these things, uh, you know, um, how, how close all of these people were and, like, how all of this activity is happening in what we would consider now a very, very small geographic area of New York City. Yeah, I just realized that I miscoded this as you were complimenting. Me. So the, the oh. purple one on top, the pink and the purple look the same. So ah. Gomez's shop is all the way up here, okay. um, all the way up here. What you're looking at down here is Meyer Myers' uh, silversmith shop. So he was one of the more prominent, think like Paul Revere, yes. um, silversmiths in New York City. He became a freeman in the 1740s. Um, he had a few shops, so he moved around. So the one that I picked out here is the one that he opened up in the 1780s, which was on Beaver Street, which you can see here. Um, He was very good at what he did. Um, I'm gonna show you some images because I was able to find some of his work that still existed, which was very exciting. Um, These are from- Are, are, you know, um, very reputable, like great museums and yeah, he was- Yeah, the shoe buckles were my favorite because the detail on there was wonderful. Um, He did a lot of made to order so you would have to go in there and kind of ask him for specifics, which is nice because I think we forget about that as 21st century people of going into yeah. a store and buying mass produced things. Um, he had seven children with his second wife, Joyce Mears, um, during the Revolutionary War. I think we haven't pointed out that a lot of Sharif Israel left under Satius because he was a patriot. So as they realized that the British were moving in and they would occupy the city of New York for the entire duration of the war, um, he convinced most of the congregation to leave because I think it, if they were leaving to me, that indicates safety concerns or that they weren't siding with the crown. Um, he moves the entire congregation to Norwalk, Connecticut. He takes all of the religious documents with him. They close up the congregation and they just move. Yeah. So he goes with his family in 1776. And then in 1783, which is when a lot of these stores change over is when everybody comes back and they reopen the doors to the congregation again. The congregation also moved multiple times. Um, Mm -hmm. After Mill Street, they moved to, I think, Crosby Street, and then again to like 19th Street, and then to where they are now, which is where they have been um, for a significant period of time. Um, AJHS has a has an archival collection. I'll pull up that finding aid very quickly so people can see it. Um, so where, where are we? Here we are. So um, these are the congregational records that we have. It's actually um, like a lot of these um, early collections, it's relatively small simply because so much documentation gets lost over time. You know, just about every archival collection, even modern ones have holes. Um, and so this is I-4. It was a collection that was given to us in, I believe, um, like 1935, I want to say. I'm actually just looking at my notes as to exactly when it was given to us. Um, yes, it appears that it was given to us around, <clears throat> excuse me, around 1935. Um, by the rabbi at that point in time, who is uh, was Poole. 
um, who was the rabbi there for many years and became Rabbi Emeritus. Um, I might add, as I said, you see a lot of sort of repeat names in um, a lot of the Jewish organizations and institutions. And so he was the rabbi at Sharif Israel, but he was also first vice president and then president of the American Jewish Historical Society. So he gave 10 boxes, which includes um, a lot of this really beautiful 17th and 18th century material. And so if you're looking at the finding aid um, along the right-hand side here, so you can see we have administration, stuff about services and celebrations, um, and this has all been digitized. Um, this has all been um, fully digitized, so you can look at this from wherever. Um, however, that is all that we have about the congregation. Or the, I mean, look at that. That's You can still see the seal. The digitization is just so good on these things. Um, because they have maintained their own archive um, for, I, I'm not even sure how long. It is a substantial archive. And they maintain it themselves, um, the congregation, which a lot of congregations do, as they, uh, you know, would like to keep those materials within the congregation for their own use, and um, you know, to really keep those within the community that um, you know that created them. But there we go. All right, I'll stop my share now. How about we do Heim Solomon, and then a bunch of questions coming in. I can see that number okay. popping up and popping up. So we'll talk about Heim Solomon, who is oh, yes. most notable. I have, yes. I have a Heim Solomon. Yes, I do. There he is. I'll put that up on the Oh, yes, the stamp. A bit. the yeah, stamp. because no portrait of Heim Solomon exists. That is correct. No so, actual portrait of Heim Solomon exists. Yeah. I understand that because no portrait of Samuel Francis exists. Uh, so sometimes you just have to make do with it. Uh, so yeah. I think we were talking about this when we were doing our initial kind of where we want this lecture to go of mm -hmm. Heim Solomon being pushed as this monolith for the Jewish community in the Revolutionary War. And the two of us went, yeah, but no. But no. Um, but no. Yes and no. <laughs> yes and no. And the myth around Heim Solomon that I didn't fully understand until I kind of started digging as well. Yeah. It's, I didn't really either. And so um, for those that want a great sort of short-ish read on this, um, a historian named Beth Wenger, who's just a fantastic historian, did a book called History Lessons. And um, one chapter is on what she calls the myth and monuments of Han Solomon. And um, it's a very, very measured take on this because the thing is this, there's not a whole lot of documentation about his early life. And so that's also part of the problem. But what is documented is actually pretty fantastic. You know, he, um, he emigrated from Poland, um, became by all accounts, a very successful broker and financier, um, you know, settled here, did very, very well for himself because he knew multiple languages. He was really um, just did incredibly well in like international trade because he had um, establishing these international business contacts, right? He also um, was captured by the British. Um, supposedly sprung from the clink by the Hessians because they wanted his help because he knew all these languages. They wanted his help to, um, to get provisions and to trade. He all, however, he was 100% on the side of the revolution. He um, spied supposedly for the colonists while he was doing this work for the Hessians, supposedly helped um, other prisoners escape and like Robert Morris, like Mordecai Sheftal, who's sort of out of the scope of this because he was a Southern um, Jewish American. They provided an enormous amount of financial assistance to the revolution, either by their own funds, by provisioning, or by brokering influx of international cash and influx of cash from other rich people to the revolutionary cause. Because listen, wars cost a lot of money. I mean, you got to feed all these people. You have to, they need uniforms, they need muskets and bayonets and tents and all of this stuff. And, and it's easier if you're the British crown because you can tax everybody to get that money and hire Hessians and mercenaries and whatever. Um, but the revolutionaries didn't have that same advantage of like financial infrastructure. So Han Solomon did all of that. He was responsible for a lot of critical large cash infusions to the revolution. So this is a great legacy. I mean, just that in and of itself, like, deserves the, you know, Haim Solomon, financial hero on the stamp, a statue, but. Yeah, but. Here's the but. <laughs> um, but this narrative sprung up really in the early to mid 19th century, which was largely propagated by his youngest child. Haim Solomon died very young. 
Oh, you know, well, in his 40s, I think he was like 45, 44 or 45. His youngest child had not even been born yet. His poor wife um, was actually pregnant with the youngest child at the time he passed away. And so this, this young child grew up, I think, really with this fierce desire, you know, to make sure that his father got his due. And so, and, and petitioned Congress basically said, um, the government owes us all this money because we, the family personally lent the government all, re lent the revolutionary cause all this money. And so it went through Congress multiple times, got on the floor, was voted on, never really went anywhere. Um, but it really started, that was what's really started to inflate this narrative of, um, that you started to see in, um, and this legend of Haim Solomon, the financier of the revolution, the idea that he had personally given all this money. Um, so then you cut to late 19th, early 20th century, the, um, the new descendants start agitating for Haim Solomon's uh, recognition again. This time they don't want money, they want a medal, like the government to issue him a medal. And supposedly it was, uh, again, it got through all these committees, was recommended by, I think the Library of Congress, but for some reason it just went nowhere. Well, cut a few years more and people start agitating for a statue. They want a monument. And who is very vociferously advocating for this is the Polish Jewish community because Haim Solomon was born in Poland. So just like, you know, um, the general American Jewish community wants to assert this, um, you know, this claim of legitimacy and like we were here and look at what we did and we helped found this country, they want him to get his due. So they start pushing for a monument. AJHS has already been founded at this point, who have a vested interest in this. And you would think they would be gung ho, yay, we want a monument to Haim Solomon. Um, and then one of the earliest um, like founders of the AJHS, Samuel Oppenheim, who was, I believe, a rabbi, but absolutely a scholar, actually went to the Philadelphia Hall of Records, Municipal Archives, whatever the title was at the time, and dug through all these financial records and said, went back to the AJHS and said, listen, um, he brokered these deals, but he didn't actually, I, we can't prove that he personally lent the money. Like it, because we don't think he had it. Like they were looking at all these financial records that preceded his death. And they were like, we don't think he had it to lend. He absolutely facilitated it. But the narrative that they're pushing is not exactly true. And as you can imagine, this caused a great controversy. Um, within and, and a great deal of infighting within the American Jewish community. And actually, um, Mary, can I share my screen for a second? Because I have Absolutely. a bunch of um, I just want to point out, I do know, I just realized I did spell his last name wrong. I see those comments. Uh, it did not pick that up. And I do apologize. Uh, mine is auto-corrected a few yeah. times. So and it, the, it changes it to it Salmon. Is, you know, yeah. the, the, what autocorrect believes is the- uh, I do apologize. You guys are right that there was a spelling error. Thank you for I didn't even. That. I didn't even see it. Um, hold on a second here. Um, let me pull up my, so I have a few slides here. So, oh, that's cheap as well. so, um, so then Samuel Oppenheimer, or Samuel Oppenheimer has all this research. He dies, unexpected, but before he dies, he sends it to a guy named Max Kohler. And Max Kohler, whose papers we have at the AJHS, he was um, also a very prominent member of the American Jewish community, descended from two extremely prominent rabbis and scholars. He himself was um, a very famous lawyer, argued cases in front of the Supreme Court. Um, some of his cases are still referenced today. He fought against immigration quotas. He fought like for the rights of immigrants. And in his spare time was also a historian and a heavy hitter at the AJHS. So he gets Oppenheim stuff and he reaches out to the Heim Solomon Monument Committee and this guy, Teigl, uh, as you can see from this letter. And he's like, thanks for sending me this, but there's no evidence here. And he said, like, I want to repeat that what I've said several times that I think you're, um, that you're committing a gross fraud on the public. I mean, this gets so nasty um, so fast, basically, um, between all of these historians and members of the American Jewish community that's basically pitting sort of the established people in places like the AJHS, who were largely um, German Jews uh, or Jews that had been there for a very much longer time, um, who were in these large communal organizations and then the Polish Jewish community. And so um, 
This basically what's happening here is the kind of things you see now on scholarly listservs where everybody just, where people have very, very strong opinions about this and it's all going back and forth. And so they're writing letters to congressmen. They're sending each other Western Union photographs. This is our telegrams. This is all from Max Kohler's papers. And then they start a dueling war of publications. So you have um, Heim Solomon, Patriot Broker of the Revolution by Max Kohler, an open letter to one of the congressmen who I guess had been um, open to this. And then a different one, which is Teigl's uh, account, which is um, this much, much more embellished account of what's going on. And so it gets just um, incredibly ugly and it's being played out. These are just a few of the snippets. Max Kohler um, is getting pilloried um, in the press. They're fighting this in every Jewish newspaper, basically in the nation, um, this incredibly public infight. And Max Kohler uh, appeared to save every single one of these articles, even the ones that are bad press about him, because I guess no, no press is bad press. And what eventually happens is, um, at least in New York City, it just kind of dies out. Um, Max Kohler dies in 36. A monument is never put up here. Um, instead, there's the one in Chicago, which has Solomon with Robert Morris and George Washington. Um, but so why was the AJHS so against this, right? Like even because he obviously, and it's clear in what Kohler writes, he did all these things, like he had all these accomplishments. What Kohler and all of these people were very worried about was the idea that if they put up this monument that was based on these inflated claims, that there would eventually be blowback on the American Jewish community about it. The idea that, well, this was wrong. Like we built this statue to this guy and it turns out he never really gave the money personally. And they were very afraid then of what, um, what would happen, you know, uh, what that would mean for the American Jewish community who was already, you know, struggling with um, a lot of anti-Semitic propaganda and uh, political sentiment in the late 19th and early 20th century as well. But um, it is um, absolutely a fascinating, uh, <laughs> a fascinating chapter um, in- Time you know, deserves his own chat. Yeah, it, it honestly deserves it. And I didn't know any of this really myself, you know, and really until I started digging into this. And, um, and that's why the Beth Wenger chapter, I really recommend so heavily because one of the things that she points out is by this, hugely embellished legacy, like myth, it totally obscures a lot of what he actually did and yeah. kind of takes away from, um, you know, from like the true narrative, like it really didn't need to be, like the whole story about supposedly, according to, according to modern historians, and we have the benefit now of 200 years of subsequent documentation, um, you know, like the whole Yom Kippur thing, the idea that supposedly George Washington, in, you know, sent somebody to interrupt services, and Solomon was like, this is so important. It was put in a movie. He was played, I, I think, by Claude Rains. And, but you know what that's like? It's totally apocryphal. As far as I know, there's no actual documentation. It's like Washington chopping down the cherry tree. It's one of those things that people- Just gets perpetuated. Yeah. Just believe because you say it enough times and there was enough truth, I think, in what he did. And I think also, you know, um, American Jews at that point really, again, you know, wanted wanted this hero wanted this revolutionary war hero and um and hey it was a great story right and so that is the uh yeah that's the story of Heinz Solomon and um we also have a uh, a small archival collection about him but again there's not an enormous amount of publicly available documentation about him a lot of what is in our collection so it's early stuff stuff relating to his death and his estate and then an enormous amount of correspondence to and from the AJHS over this whole um, controversy over the Solomon legacy. So it's, uh, it's All right. quite we're a story. Just given our five minutes heads up. So I yeah. want to open it up to questions. I was trying to read through it and they are so interesting. Um, Sarah, do you see anything that sticks out to you? because there's a hundred yes. comments and I can't go through all of them yes. in the next five minutes. I have, been, I have been keeping track, but you all had like such a good flow going. I didn't want to <laughs> poke any holes in that. Um, so a question I saw was we talked about, you know, some outspoken patriots. Were there any like really famous Jewish loyalists in New York or widely that you're familiar with? Um, um, I know you said that. I found two. 
I found two. I found Abraham Wag. Uh, it was sought to aid the peace negotiations. These are just like things that I was able to like take. Um, mm -hmm. August 22nd, 17, 1778, he drafted a letter titled The Sentiments of a Friend to a Great Britain and America. So when we're looking at people who like the, Oliver Delancey, who started out as like a patriot, who was like, yeah, the Stamp Act is terrible. We need to stop this. And then it escalates into independence is where a lot of those initial patriots scale back and go, that's too crazy. I didn't want to do all of that. Yeah. Um, you start to see people like Abraham. I also have Isaac Hart, who was a Rhode Island shipper. So I didn't look too much into it because we were trying to focus yeah. on New York. Uh, yeah. He fled to Long Island and was bayoneted and clubbed to death by Patriot Whigs. Wow. Yeah. Um, also, like we talked about a lot of the Franks family, um, David Franks, who was the youngest son, who was the one who married, who also married um, out of the faith. Um, he was a loyalist and was jailed um, and then eventually uh, went to England. Um, a lot of the Franks family ended up going back to England. They obviously had very close ties there. Naftali basically stayed there, you know, his whole life. Um, and uh, then I believe he returned to Philadelphia after a while. But yeah. Part two. There is definitely more than enough for a part two. We could do like a whole podcast about this at this point. I mean, just like pick a family um, and go for it. Yeah. Um, and it's also because we only focused on New York. So when I saw things about Rhode Island and Charleston, and there's a uh, big population of Jews in Philadelphia and Baltimore yes. after the revolution, a lot of them moved to Baltimore. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't, I didn't dive too much into that because I was like, we got to keep it focused. Before I know. And even just within this focus, as people are it's saying, a lot. You know, there's, uh, you know, <laughs> we could do multiple, uh, yeah. you know, multiple uh, episodes about this, but yeah, I saw something about proving Hamilton. Yeah. I'm so, I'm so was, attuned to see that name. The question was um, any documentation on the possibility of Hamilton being Jewish. I know that is something that has come up a lot whenever we talk about Hamilton. Um, it's not the first time I've heard it. I'm not in a position to say yes or no. I think I've heard it in rumblings. Michael Newton, I think might have a talk mm -hmm. on that if I'm not mistaken. So there was um, a book put out last year called The Jewish World of Alexander Hamilton. I have not uh, read it. I have, I do know of it. Um, okay. so that will, recent publication you can that. look up. I know that, um, yes, the Andrew Porwencher, that is the oh. author in the chat. Thank you, chat. Um, so yeah, you can check that out because I know that is something that kind of comes up a lot when you talk about Hamilton. Not a lot of people know about it, but just enough people know about it to say, isn't there something about Hamilton? Is it true? Is it not? Yeah. Um, I do not believe we have anything in the AJHS archives, but to be to be clear, I'm not an expert in colonial America nor Alexander Hamilton. My expertise is the collections of the AJHS. So to my knowledge, um, we, we do not have anything. And I will tell you um, that certainly in the early days of the AJHS, in our founding in 1892, we celebrate our 130 birthday on June 7th next month. Um, the first thing supposedly that they wanted to do was to try to prove that Christopher Columbus was Jewish. Uh, he was not. I've heard that too. Unsuccessful. So if there was, I, I think if there was anything that was that the early people at the AJHS could have claimed Alexander Hamilton as Jewish, I think that they would have, they would have jumped on it. I think that that would have been a big priority. <laughs> so we have time for one more question. I see it slowly encroaching onto 730. Yes. Um, oh my gosh, there's so many. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, so the, the cemetery that was on your map, I believe there are some revolutionary soldiers buried in these Sharia Israel cemeteries. We had a question. About yes, that. there is, I think over a dozen Patriot soldiers buried there in addition to uh, Satius, some of the Gomez's are buried in there, some of the Franks. I think Myra Mayers is also buried in that a Chatham Square one. I'm gonna pull that up um, because I love a good map. Um, so Sharif Israel has, as New York City expands and they start filling up uh, cemeteries essentially, uh, and they start barring live like burials 1830s, 1850s, 1870s. There's four total that they maintain today. And I was trying to read into who is buried where, but there's so many. Um, 
Let me pull up that map. There we go. Um, but there are a few definitely buried in that one and it's by Chatham Square um, and it's still there. And I think you, I don't think you can go in but you definitely can walk by and see it um, as most are 17th and 18th century churchyards. It is the second oldest next to Trinity Church which I didn't realize because I always forget that Trinity Church has a churchyard blocks from my <laughs> employment place. Um, but yeah, they, I think the sons do, the sons of the revolution in the state of New York who uh, own and operate Francis Tavern, I think they go to the Memorial Day service um, that's celebrated there. I think, okay. I think that's a fair statement. Um, so I know that they still do commemorative um, ceremonies there. I don't know if they do it for the other three set the, the three cemeteries. Uh, I don't know anybody's that. name offhand though. I I do apologize for that. Thank, thank you so much, Mary and Melanie, for spending time speaking on this topic this evening. We're so grateful uh, that for all of our attendees. Uh, that you took time out of your schedule to be with us today. A recording of this program will be available mm -hmm. both from Francis Tavern and AJHS and a follow-up email will send you the link in about a day. Take care everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you.